so we've got three chapters. Kind of the two of them are really talking about similar things here with uh, what about eight, nine, and ten. And um, now we're going to look more at kind of industry conditions, which is in some ways kind of a bizarre way to do it, but um, uh, in, in my opinion, as far as the natural progression that I'd go through with, uh, with students in principals class. Um, but, but I think it works for the context that we're doing with the MBA class. So the material you just did, that was chapters one through four again. Um, so uh, most of what we've done so far was looking at the individual firm and the profit maximizing decision on what they should do and, and the quantities that they should um, pick or, or prices to charge. And so now we're gonna look at the firms together. And in some of your homework problems, I made some comments um, on the right-hand side margin where your language was maybe just, I, you had the right thought, I think, but you kind of weren't hitting the right language. And that's some of what hopefully that'll clarify with these chapters on the market versus maybe the individual um, firm. So, um, so we're gonna get into good old supply and demand, essentially. Um, so I'm going to, uh, put down the demand curve. We did the law of demand. And what was the law of demand? And quantity demanded goes down. Good. So, so that's the one we've got to be careful of. Uh, here's the distinction that, that we're not trying to be picky, but it actually is important in the analysis of it, is that this is the demand curve. And um, the law of demand says that at this price, at $10, consumers want to buy 100 units. That's the quantity demanded at a price of $10, right? So that's one point along the demand curve. Holding all other things constant, things like what? Income, good. Related goods. related goods, external forces could be in there too, right? So, um, uh, so the price of related goods, uh, we'll talk more about that later when we get into substitutes and complements. So we got tastes and preferences. A couple that we didn't even, that I didn't even mention to you are that are classic kind of our expectations, which we'll talk about down the road, and. because we were just kind of moving through. Um, so the population of Ottawa, if uh, Ottawa's got about how many people? You guys know? 12,000 or so. It's kind of strange, but let's say Ottawa University, uh, and, and uh, this is the demand for pizza, and all of a sudden OU goes from a population of 600 student population to a population of 1,200. What happens to the demand? I see David's eyes gleaming because he knows he's got pay raise coming if, if he helps <laughs> contribute to that. What happens to the demand curve if simply the student population of, a of uh, Ottawa increases from 600 to 1,200 with the demand for pizza? At a price of $10, the company used to sell Pizza Time or Pizza Village used to sell 100 pizzas. Now what is true? They're going to sell. Price is going to go up. Price stay the same, but demand's going to shift. That's right. So that's where we want to think about the shifters affecting the quantity demand. Remember when I gave you that kind of fancy notation that the the quantity demanded of pizza is equal to a function of the price of pizza plus income plus price of related goods. Uh, pizza time and Pizza Village, two substitute pizzas that might impact, right? If the Pizza Time runs a special, Pizza Village might suffer if they run a super uh, price deal. Um, and now we could throw in population, the population. So as the population increases, the quantity demanded at each price increases. So 
At $10, we used to want to buy 100 pizzas, now we want to buy more. Even if the price was $8, we used to want to buy this much when the student population was 600, but now that the student population is 1,200, we want to buy more. At a low, low price of, we don't even have little Caesars here, but somewhere $5 a pizza, right? We used to want to buy this many pizzas, now we want to buy this many pizzas. So at every price, we are relocating the demand curve to the right, which is the shift of the demand. And notice that this is one of those external influences. The pizza place, of course, had nothing to do with the student population. They're just a competitor in there. And so as the population of Ottawa grows, so does the demand for pizza. When we isolate price all by itself, that's what the law of demand is, as Donald said. When the price falls, all of the things constant, what things? These things. As the price falls from 10 to 8, then we sell more pizza. And then we went through the elasticity of demand, the price elasticity, the income elasticity, the uh, cross price elasticity, and indeed we can create an elasticity for anything. All right, so now we're starting to see kind of the market in general. Um, and the other piece of the market is our supply. So this was all consumer related. And so if we draw a supply curve in here, the quantity supplied of pizza is a function of its price. And now put your pizza time cap on, or pizza village cap. By the way, I got to see it. So how many of you, have you eaten at both places? See, that's, that's the problem I'm trying to tackle. Heard it's not very good. That's what I heard too. Jason, where are you at? Did you eat at Pizza Village? <clears throat> I've tried them both. I heard Pizza Village wasn't very good, but I wanted to see for myself. And what did you determine? It wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And did you try the Dennis? I don't like like the really like sweet marinara. Okay. Like, where it's, yeah. All right, so here's my recommendation. In, Everybody I brought to it thinks it's the bomb. Mm -hmm. Some pretty good places in New York and Chicago and other places. Village. It's called the Dennis. The Dennis. Now it's a meat type of pizza. So if you're not into meat, especially if you're vegetarian, you're not going to dig it. But I swear it is this thick, full of ingredients. It takes extra long for them to cook. So maybe you just ordered a regular old pepperoni or something or other. Uh, get the Dennis. It's one of their specialty pizzas. And actually, I've had, now that I got turned on to the Dennis, I had some student clubs at my house and stuff, and I ordered a number of the specialty pizzas, and a lot of them are really good. So um, I had my student group uh, for a class. Um, actually, uh, it was Leadership and Creativity and Change, David. Remember when we did yeah, Trendle yeah, Lumber? Yeah. As an undergrad, David was yeah. in that class and we went and did Trendle Lumber. Well, we did Pizza Village huh. and did the same thing. And, and so I'm going to come back to the owners this summer with some suggestions on uh, different things. Because I, I think they get a bad rap. I think they've got really good pizza. Now, again, you know, there's a few people whose preferences might not. But I brought my parents. I brought some people from church. And they started going there regularly now. And, and so... Give it another, give it another whirl, but try the try the specialty pizza. See what you think. All right, so I don't know. That was quite a sidetrack here, but so the Pizza Village owners, what are some things that go into their equation that determine how much pizza they're going to bring to the market? Now, let me just give you a hint. One of them is not the population. That's the demand side. So. These overlap here, but the rest of them might kind of be on, on their own. So what determines the quantity supplied? Right on, on that price-related goods could be like price-related like resources. 
Yeah, okay, so it's price of related, uh, this one's a little bit tricky one, so I'm just gonna give it to you, but, but you're on the right track. There is something with related, but it's related outputs. So the price of related outputs. So um, the classic example of this is uh, bees, wax, and honey. There's not as many of these, by the way, beeswax and honey. An easier one, this is when they're complements, it's a little bit tougher. If honey prices go up, then uh, bee farmers or honey farmers, I don't know what you call them, uh, end up increasing production. But as a byproduct of bringing more honey to the market, they bring more beeswax. So those two things are complementary in production. So they're complements in, in the production process. Goods cannot, so these are complements. So we do have comps and subs. On, for substitutes, we can look at uh, a farmer maybe with the price of soybeans and corn. So soybeans and corn. Um, with, uh, with even the pizza place, we could talk about chicken wings and pizza maybe or something like that, where uh, I think it's a little more concrete here where you've got a, a fixed piece of land of resources and you can either plant that in soybeans or you can plant it in corn. And what's going to drive that uh, decision? What is the expected price of corn? What is the expected price of, of soybeans? What, what, what do we think we're going to make the most money on? And then that's what we plant it with, right? So that's going into the decision process of how much pizza to bring to market might be the price of, uh, we could even think breadsticks maybe, or the price of uh, you know, chicken wings or something else. Okay, um, the other big one, I just want you to pull out one more. It's pretty obvious on what's gonna drive how much quantity of pizza pizza village owners can bring to the market. Pick the tough one, actually, starting off with price of related outputs. It's a good one, but it's a tougher one. There's one more obvious. What makes them be able to bring supply more or supply less in the production process? Storage. Mm hmm. What about them? The amount they produce. So yeah, for a given production process, um, that's, what, what's that going to determine? More productive employees are going to earn more or less pay. More productive earn more pay. More, earn more pay, right? So what are some of the things if, they, if they're not more productive, but the government says minimum wage is going up to $15 an hour? How do you think that affects the supply of pizza? Is that going to increase the supply of pizza when wages, minimum wage doubles? No. It's going to go down, right? Might even put them out of business, some of the small businesses. They'll, they'll try to adjust, but we'll have to see. Ultimately, they're going to have, pizza prices are going to have to go up, but they're going to have to go up at pizza time too. You know, so minimum wage legislation is kind of a, a dicey thing, and, and uh, if the, the fear is that it might cause less people to go out for pizza and go buy a frozen one. Because the frozen pizza probably doesn't depend on minimum wage. Why? Why would the frozen pizza? What's that? Possibly day laborers. So contract labor. Where is that pizza being made? In a factory with lots of labor or lots of machines. Big old machine, right? So minimum wage goes up. Frozen pizza makers, they might be digging that. They're like, wow, you know, if people are wanting pizza, they're more likely, if they were eating out for pizza two times a week, they might cut back to one and a half times a week and just decide to have their pie at home. And that might give greater incentive for frozen pizza makers to up their game. You know, we've kind of seen that over the last 10 years. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm getting old here. I'm thinking for sure 20 years where the rising crust and you know the, they get better and better those frozen pizzas so as it becomes more incentive because of pizza uh, at the Main Street pizzas going up the fresh made pizzas that might give rise to, um, to the frozen pizza prices being in 
more demand. All right, so those are some things here. So price of resources in general. So I, I mentioned minimum wage or wages in general. Maybe there's a union situation and unions pressing wages up. Again, we could add stuff like expectations and weather. So there's a few others to add on to the list, but I just want you to think, and we'll, we'll talk more about those later, um, later today too. But these are variables that impact the quantity being supplied to the market by our businesses. All right, so what's going on here? Let's just cut to the chase. What's going on at point A? Okay, be careful with your language. Since I picked on you last time, this is a perfect time to pick on you again. Supply is equal to demand is what you said. You're really, really close, and you're kind of right in a sense that the two curves intersect each other. So kind of add on to that for me a little bit more. Or anybody, add on to Donald's statement. Tell me kind of just longer. So supply equals demand. Got it. Two lines crossed. I see some sort of equal thing going on there. Tell me the story a little bit more detailed. I don't like those critical thinking problems. A little more detail. You say at that price, okay. that's where at price of eight dollars. Yeah, quantity demanded is going to equal the price that the supply is going to be willing to sell that, cut that, that quantity. Okay, yeah, you're you you were you were awesome, awesome, awesome. So at a price of eight dollars, the quantity demanded is one fifty. Is also equal to the the quantity supplied, right? Just to be really picky about it, uh, the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. So $8 is kind of the price that's out there. The thing that's difficult <coughs> with some of this that I'll, I'll try to clarify is we generally have the impression that companies set prices, right? They determine if they're going to charge $8 for a pizza or $10 for a pizza. And I'm not going to disagree with you. In reality, that's, that's exactly what goes on. But we start to think, do they really have perfect discretion to set their pizza price? Let's have a real discussion about this. I mean, uh, let's say a price pizza is, is uh, $12.95. You know? if, if they can set any price, why not set $21? Gosh, I had a pizza and I went to Colorado. I, I couldn't believe it. I actually talked to the manager afterwards. But um, my brother orders uh, two pizzas for me to pick up and some fancy place that he heard about or somebody knew about, or they ate there earlier or something. So I get to the cash register. Uh, okay, two pizzas, that'll be $74. I'm like, $74? I'm like, wow. Uh, okay, and I was in a different state, you know, I'm really thinking maybe there's some weird taxes. Of course, the economist to me is thinking, why are, why are these prices so crazy? And my brother had said this is really, 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 really good pizza. And so uh, she finally, I had to ask for the receipt, and I looked at it, and one of the pizzas was $40, and the other one was 30 basically. On the, on the menu, it was 28 you know, and then plus tax or whatever. So... It looked like my brother had specified a, ordering a bunch of ingredients. And so the $40 pizza, long story short, ended up being similar to one of their specialty pizzas that had about that many ingredients. So I talked to the manager and he took 10 bucks off. But still, $30 a pizza, right? Okay, so my point with all that is here we are in Ottawa. Uh, what, what keeps people in Ottawa from charging $28 for pizza? For that awesome Dennis pizza, by the way, I think it's... 14, 15, maybe 16 bucks. I mean, and, and like I said, it was full. Way bit, by the way, that pizza in Colorado was not that good. I, I mean, for, for the price. It was a good pizza, but it wasn't like loaded up with uh, stuff. So the dentist is much better. Okay. So we got to think about quality and price. That gives them some flexibility, right? But if I'm the owner's Pizza Village and, and I like money and I like profit 
and I'm currently charging $16 for the dentist, why not charge $26? Okay, income of people where we're at would be one of the factors. Good, what else? That's what I was gonna say. You just gotta know the culture of the income that's okay. the population. What else? So this price, the ability to set price is determined in part by the income, but what's another factor? You're right, I'm not disagreeing with you. Competing businesses, I think, is probably even a bigger factor than that, perhaps. If Pizza Village was the only pizza place in town, that might be something, but what do we got? We got Casey's, Pizza Hut, uh, Pizza Time. Papa yeah, I heard Papa John's is coming. I heard that too. Shortstop has some pizza. So there, there's people out there that, man, you'd be lucky to squeeze another 50 cents out of that dentist pizza, perhaps, or another buck. Right? Maybe they do have an underpriced, I don't know for sure. I bet. But my point with that is that there really is bounds that are determined by these factors in the marketplace. And so in a competitive environment, the firms tend to be more what we call price takers. They take the price that the market sets. Now, this is where it gets a little bit weird because we still give them some pricing discretion. You know, they're gonna be able to wiggle their price or run a coupon or, you know, or change it, but they're, they're not gonna have much to discretion. All right, so um, let me go over the spectrum of competition. In fact, I think I did, um, I might have gave you guys the video on this before, but this is the right time to have this discussion. Did anybody remember a spectrum of competition? Maybe I didn't, honestly, I can't remember for sure, but it might be coming up. So, uh, we want to think about the different environments that firms might operate in. Okay, so the pizza environment is one thing. Now, how does the pizza environment differ from the web browser environment, the search engine environment? Who's our player in the search engine environment that you guys are familiar with? Google. Okay, and what other ones are there? Yahoo. Yahoo, Bing. And then all of a sudden we hit a stone wall, right? Ask.com, maybe, I don't know. Do you guys use any of these? Or they might have been one long time ago. So pretty quickly, so I think I heard some data that Google controls 70, 75%, or I should say control, but they have 70 to 75% of the search engine market, okay? So there we just, we couldn't even get up to the number of pizza places in little old Ottawa. And here we're talking about a global phenomenon of search engines, right? So different environments for each firm and how they go about maximizing profits. And so that's what I want to think about, or what are the key factors that determine that environment? All right, so we've got this spectrum, or I refer to it as a spectrum of competition. Spectrum of competition. And I think this will help us get through these three chapters a little bit better. This is not something that's in your, in your book per se, although he talks about these different things. At one end of the spectrum, we have perfect competition. Perfect competition. And this is really uh, more or less a theoretical construct. All right? it, it, for the most part, doesn't exist in the real world. But it's going to help frame the question and, and think about what's going on in reality. And so the three characteristics of perfect competition is that there's lots of sellers. So many sellers. Now many is, is kind of a weird word. Here's how many that I want you to think about. Suppose this bucket um, has water in it up this high. If I take an eyedropper and put one drop of water, do you see the water level rise? No, right? That's how many sellers. Each seller is a drop of water in this bucket. In other words, so I'm talking about a big deal. Many, 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 I should put like thousands or whatever, but I, I don't wanna, I just wanna characterize it as so many that each one individually is relatively insignificant to the marketplace. If they go out of business, it doesn't affect the business. That's one drop of water out of the bucket, right? 
So that's our many sellers in, in this perfectly competitive environment. Number two, each seller has a homogeneous product. In other words, each seller has basically identical products. We see this in some industries, even online. Um, you know, if we, if we look at uh, some Nike shoes, the Nikes themselves are unique, but if we now restrict ourselves to the number of online stores and or uh, 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 brick and mortar stores to get the, that particular brand of Nikes that exact same size, there's thousands of places to go, right? go to Amazon, you go to this seller, and Amazon has a number of sellers that are selling that product, right? So we can think of a homogeneous product possibly that way. So no seller has really an edge on a particular product in perfect competition. And finally, there is free entry and exit. Free entry and exit. In other words, it's really easy to start up a business in this industry. You want to become an online retailer? Boom, you're, you are one, right? All they needed was a, a free web page and somehow get your name out there or something. So pretty easy to start up a business and pretty easy to shut it down as well. So free entry and exit. So we kind of got this feeling of firms coming in and out of the space pretty uh, easily. All right, so those three characteristics make up perfect competition. Probably the closest example to this in the United States is farming or agricultural industry, right? So if we talk about farmer Tom, Dick, and Harry, and they're making corn in the middle of Iowa, there's a whole bunch of farmers. Each farmer's product is basically identical from uh, the other one, and it's pretty easy to start up a business and shut it down, go plant some corn and get back out. Now, in reality, that's where it gets a little funny with commercial farming, we start getting into big heavy equipment and there might be some entry costs to really compete at the same level that the big farmers do. So, so uh, if we think back 100 years ago, it was probably closer to this where we can just till up our ground and, and go. So that's one of the better examples of kind of getting closer to this competitive environment. At the other end of the spectrum, we have monopoly. And monopoly, by definition, is one seller. So instead of many sellers, what if we have only one? And that one seller, since there is only one, if we have um, a single product firm, they have a homogeneous product because they're the only show in town. And finally, there are barriers to entry. So, um, the only supplier of natural gas here in Ottawa is Kansas Gas. So they're a monopoly. How did they get that power? The only supplier of electricity is the city of Ottawa. Mainly because they had that power. That, that was the point of the free market economy. It was having a competitive I guess because Ottawa has such a small population. Uh, if you go to any city, you'll likely find the same thing. Oh, really the same thing. Yep. Like government regulation. Government regulation, that's right. So um, remember last time we talked about economies of scale? Who remembers what that is? I can't remember. Was that on this test that we just did? Isn't it like producing more of a product? Yeah, producing more of a product does what to your cost? Lowers your long run average cost, right? So we, we increase the scale of production and it brings down those costs. So with gas and electricity, it's pretty expensive to develop all of the infrastructure. And at the end of the day, we can probably provide uh, these basic utilities at the lowest price possible in theory by having only one firm bring it to the table. Because if there was two firms competing on it or four firms competing on it, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of those large economies of scale. However, 
What do you think would happen if we left only one seller in the market unregulated? Then we get into the price issue, right? We can get into the setting price. We said like, well, well what if what keeps Pizza Village in check from you know, $16, why don't they charge $26? Well, if they're the only show in town and you really need pizza, which is a stretch, right? But here, you really need natural gas to heat your home or something. They've got a little bit of power over the consumer. All right, so um, now there's a little bit of controversy out in the uh, economics Voluntary choice, and let's say there wa it wasn't government re uh, regulated, and, and let's say Kansas Gas jacked up the prices to some astronomical level. Uh, what what would happen? Would life cease to exist? Or tell me about how the market might discipline even a monopolist. Okay, they'd use less gas, and in order to do that, what would they do? Create alternatives, right? So even you know the, the the perception out there is that oh well we got to watch out for those monopolies because they'll start you know taking advantage. You know Google has been kind of under like do they have a monopoly in search engines? But yet they offer this service for free and it makes everybody better off. It seems to make a lot of people happy to have a good search engine to be able to get the stuff. So are we really being pounded by a monopolist? You know, go back to Microsoft. Uh, when they were more dominant, they came in under antitrust laws for being a monopoly and we're talking about overstretching you know, their power. Um, you know, was that all there? Uh, some economist, and I would probably tend to lean on this side, would say having a monopoly per se isn't necessarily a problem because it pushes other entrepreneurs to develop alternatives. And they do. Eventually those monopolies disappear. They're, there's not one out there standing, even when the government protected them with regulation, which is usually the key to maintaining your monopoly, is getting in fat with your, with your congressman and getting a new law passed that keeps competitors out and gives you this edge. So um, that's a topic that we'll talk more about later too. That's called cronyism, and that's one of the most detrimental things in my opinion to our economy is when we have business people Get, getting in tight with the, with the government. And so if we preserve these um, uh, competition and we eliminate barriers to entry, then the fact that there's one firm that's really serving the public well, who cares? Kind of like Google. I mean, what do they do? They're really serving the public. They're really bringing benefit to us. And they happen to be doing it, knocking the pants off of everybody else. And so there happens to be one of them, but yet, is there barriers to entry? Not in the sense of it's just because of their good brand and their what being evil. Um, it's just kind of a fact of life that we have to be uh, uh, leery of, but um, we might, uh, I think there's been examples in history where the government has caused more problems by regulating the industry than satisfying a problem. Uh, one of the classic examples is rail, the railroads. So early on, there, there's kind of a long story, and I don't know it perfectly, but the, the gist of it is that uh, the railroad tycoons kind of successfully lobbied for uh, keeping rail prices low, and so they protected the industry. And have you heard that Japan has nice rails that go 200 miles an hour and get people to places, you know? that. The rail system around the world developed in different ways, whereas ours looks very similar to the way it did 75 years ago. We still got kind of the same tracks, the same looking type of cars, you know, plugging along. And then we had the uh, trucking industry develop more as a result of that. And so a lot of that had to do with the government coming in and a lot of people look at that narrative and they think, oh, well, look at railroads. That's all owned. Okay, so uh, questions or comments so far? <clears throat> so the real world lies in between here. And so 
the, the, the approach that Frobe took was to really focus on more on the in-between parts. He talks about monopoly, but he's really talking about some hybrids for the most part. Um, and so I, uh, that's what I like to clarify. I think it's easier to see these, these polar extremes and then think about reality because the important components in the marketplace are still these fundamental three things. And so the, the one extreme that we'll spend a lot of time on here that's on the, on the spectrum is actually closer in here is called monopolistic, monopolistic competition. And this is the one Frobe, in fact, let me, uh, I will give you Frobe's definition. Because again, he kind of just talks in general. If I can find it here. Let's see. Nine. I think it's in nine. So monopoly. <clears throat> A monopoly firm is one that faces a downward sloping demand curve. They produce a product or service with no close substitutes, they have no rivals, and there are barriers and there are barriers to entry so that no other firms can enter the industry. Okay, so with his extra thing there, he, he kind of adds on the three these three these three components to it. So he, he's pretty close. But a downward sloping demand curve is also something that Pizza Village faces, but they're more in this, um, this type of competition, monopolistic competition. And so with monopolistic competition, there are still many sellers, just like perfect competition. There's free entry and exit. Now you can see the one I'm gonna have to differentiate. Pretty easy to start up a pizza place on Main Street for the most part. Not a lot of restrictions. And number two is where we have a difference, and that's with a differentiated product. Differentiated product. So if firms have a product that's slightly different from each other, how does that change the game? Well, that's where most of the things on the shelves at Walmart are, right? How do um, shampoo companies differentiate themselves. Let me throw that out to you. What, what's that? Okay, good. So different types of applications and they might specialize in one or the other. Good. What else? Let's say two shampoos that are both for straight hair or something. How do those two companies differentiate? What's that? Different scents, good. So that could be they smell slightly different. As far as the, the utility of cleaning your hair, they both perform equally well, but one's got a little lavender scent and one's got some clean, fresh scent, okay? What's the reliability? Perhaps. I, I don't know what you mean by re reliability with shampoo. Are we still on shampoo? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do, like how long do like the curls, like the, the head and shoulders, you know? Okay. So something with quality, back to little quality differences, the reliability of how well it performs, okay? Market direction. Market direction, market packaging, advertising, right? So the actual bottle itself looks a little bit different on how it, and how many TV ads they run, all kinds of ways that they can start to make their product appear a little different, even if the contents of the bottle are pretty darn close to their competitor, there's ways that they can change things up. So we go to the fast food industry, McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's, they all have a hamburger, they're all on a different day, one that you might pick, they're pretty close substitutes with each other. Same thing with the pizza example. So we've got that differentiated product. Um, <clears throat> so with this, they have a downward sloping demand curve, but because of the number of substitutes, there's not a lot of pricing power. So with monopolistic competition, not a lot of pricing power. But they do have some. So 
So if that's the case, how would you draw their demand curve for their bottle of shampoo or their pizza? What would that demand curve look like if it was a line? Would it tend to be really, really steep or a little more flat if this is the case? Flat, right? So the not a lot of pricing power is that flatness. Now, if we go back to chapter, I can't remember, four or five, is that more elastic or less elastic? Less? Donald gave a yes for less. How many people vote less? How many are on the Donald team? How many people say more? How many people need more time to think? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, it seemed like we all kind of were thinking it's somewhat flat, right? And so if we look at this, a $10 price change, or a price change from $10 to $8 leads to a big jump in quantity, right? <coughs> Is that more elastic or less? price change more responsive all right so if I if I took the uh, if I made this uh, steeper like what I was asking if it's D prime here the response is real small all right so here's the one trick you can kind of remember uh, at least for graphical representation is that as the demand curve gets more and more inelastic, it starts to look like an I or inelastic. So just kind of remember that. So when you see a graph, so when a graph, when it's flatter, it's more elastic. is a um, in perfect competition. Sorry, I'm running out of room, but I can uh, I could almost erase this. Okay, if the firm is in perfect competition, in fact, wait, let me let me I'm going to give you the traditional model because I think this is this is not your textbook either, but I think you will get it. And by the way, this is on some of the Rusty Counter Rocks videos too. Okay, so here is the market. And this is a um, perfectly, let's just go ahead and put perfectly com competitive market. So that means we've got many sellers. By the way, we have many buyers too, but many sellers, homogeneous product, free entry and exit. And over to the right here is what we call the representative firm. This is Farmer Tom, Farmer Dick, Farmer Harry. And if the price of corn was selling at $5 a bushel in the market. And Farmer Dick here, little Q, Farmer Dick cranks off a thousand bushels. How much should he expect for his thousand bushels of corn? $5. Now what if Farmer Dick doubles? his production of corn. How much should he expect now? What's that? Still five, that's right. So 
he's still a drop of water. So if the drop of water represented 1,000, if he puts 2,000, ooh, two droppers, do we see that water level rise? No, he's still insignificant. Really, no matter how much he produces, he's still small relative to the market. So at $5 price in the market at the co-op from the Chicago Board of Trade, he would expect $5 at 1,000. He's going to expect $5 at 2,000. Five dollars, 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 no matter how many bushels he brings to the market, five dollars, five dollars, five dollars. And effectively, the demand for his corn, for his world, is five dollars. And he is a price thief. Farmer. Joe, under these circumstances, is a price taker. When a company faces, I'm going to draw kind of two more unrelated graphs. When we've got Pizza Village, we've got some pricing discretion but not much of it. We have lots of closely related substitutes for pizza, and so the demand curve is relatively elastic. So with monopolistic competition for pizza, by the way, this would be a little Q here. So pizza, this is this one, TV. We have, we have a, a relatively, relatively elastic. elastic. firm. They are big Q, by the way. So there's one distinction. They are the big Q, because they're the only show in town. And so they face the market demand curve. The demand for their product is the market demand curve. And so we'd expect it to be relatively steep, or it's going to be kind of is what it is. But as we float along this spectrum, these are some of the impacts that we'll see in each of the markets, right? Perfectly horizontal, perfectly elastic, no power, price taker, little bit of pricing power, a lot more pricing power potential. These are price makers. They can set the price. In the Pizza Village example, they don't have much pricing power, but they have some and the ability to differentiate their product, these two are both examples of price makers. <clears throat> All right, questions on those so far? Does that help bring a few things into context from what we even have done so far with the individual firms? Because when we talked about the individual firms before, we, we um, didn't necessarily make these distinctions. And one of the reasons we didn't is that the basic profit maximizing issue is the same for all of them. Produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit, the marginal revenue, the marginal benefit, if you will, is equal to the marginal cost. That decision doesn't change regardless of whether you're a monopolist or whether you're Farmer Joe up here. Because you see, if Farmer Joe faces a upward sloping marginal cost curve due to the law of diminishing marginal product, then each additional corn, what's the marginal revenue in this context? What's the revenue generated by an additional unit of corn? Five, good, right? So in this context, the thousandth bushel of corn generated to me $5 worth of revenue. The 2,000th bushel of corn generated 
$5 worth of revenue. And so the marginal revenue curve lies right on top of the demand curve in this case. They're one and the same. They're actually, I put them separate here for color purposes, but they're really the same thing. And so same applies. I think this was one of your quiz questions. If we're operating at a level where the cost of the 2200th unit, the 2200th bushel costs more than the revenue, what should you do? Stop producing, yeah, produce less, move that direction, right? And similarly, if we're producing a thousand bushels and we learn that the cost of the thousandth bushel is less than the revenue generated by it, then move this direction, right? So each, each way we're moving towards here and the way I've drawn these lines at 2000, 2000 is the optimal quantity to produce where the revenue generated by the last bushel, the 2000th bushel, is $5 as well as the cost. <clears throat> okay. Um, there's one more level of detail I think I'm not going to give you because it will just add confusion rather than. Okay. Any other last questions here? There's one more thing to add on to the spectrum. And we'll get to this in chapter 14 or 15. And that is one called oligopoly. Oligopoly. It's another hybrid where if we look at the three things here, we only have a few sellers. We don't have one, we have a few. And those few sellers end up acting strategically with each other because <coughs> what one does has an impact on their bottom line, which isn't necessarily true of the individual ones here. We have drops of water in the bucket. We have drops of water so that if they do something, it doesn't really impact any other competitor. They're, they're both kind of making separate decisions. Whereas here, if we're looking at the auto industry with Ford, GM, and Chrysler for US autos, they are interrelated. There's this interdependence among the firms. And so there's a few sellers that are potentially acting strategically. They can be selling a homogeneous or differentiated product. So I mentioned Ford, GM, and Chrysler. We can look at their four-door sedan that they kick out. Obviously, they're differentiated. At the end of the day, you've got a mid-priced car that's about has all the same functionality, the same power windows and everything, a little bit of design elements, right? So you've got kind of a, a similar product, but differentiated. Whereas if we look at oil, we have a homogeneous product with few suppliers of oil in OPEC. So we've got the the countries around the world that conspire together that have been disrupted, by the way, by the technology of fracking that all of a sudden we've got other producers here in the United States that have large oil reserves. Uh, the, the um, oh, I'm trying to blank on the name. What's the North Dakota reserve? I want to say Bracken, but that's not quite right. Mm, not too important, but anyway, the large oil reserve up in North Dakota is said to be possibly bigger than what they have in Saudi Arabia in terms of the amount of oil that they're sitting on. And so you've got this awesome new technology that environmentalists are, are wondering if, if it's good and there's different environmental reports of whether it's gonna be bad for the environment or whether it's not gonna harm the environment, but they can go in and extract oil in ways that they never could before through horizontal drilling techniques. The old fashioned way was to stick an old straw down and start sucking. And now with what they got with the different types of uh, rock that are rock formations that are surrounding it, they can go down and then they can hang a left and drill this way. And so the horizontal drilling techniques have allowed them to reach greater reserves of oil than they ever could before. And so that has rocked the boat of the oil industry and certainly partially contributed to the low gasoline prices that we've enjoyed the last couple of years as the fracking technology has taken on. 
All right, and then finally with oligopoly, we have barriers to entry as well. So one seller, few sellers, barriers. We got barriers. You start to see kind of the connectivity here. We got many sellers, many sellers, homogeneous product, differentiated product, free entry, free entry. We start to see the, the things that we're tweaking as we go through that thought process. And so having all of this laid out for you is going to help you kind of work through these chapters um, as we work into some more detail of different uh, theories on how we might be able to gain a competitive advantage, for instance, is what we'll spend a little more time on in chapter uh, 10. <clears throat> okay, questions on oligopoly. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and kind of hit some PowerPoint-type stuff and look at some specific details.